Good evening, everyone. As you all know, today's expert talk is the fourth and last talk being organized as part of the seventh Karnataka Butterfly and Bee Festival Awareness Week 2023. The recordings of the previous three talks of this week, as well as the talks of the previous years, will be available on the Bangalore Butterfly Club YouTube channel. Today's topic is Butterfly Stories, What Scientists Have Learned About the World's Favorite Insect. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nitin Ravikanta Chari. Dr. Nitin is a broadly trained naturalist interested in evolution, ecology, and genomics. His introduction to biology began as a school student with his keen interest in observing and photographing insects in his backyard. This led to further develop his interest in natural history. He went on in the later years to get his PhD under Professor Carol Boggs at the University of South Carolina, where he studied the genetics of butterfly host plant interactions. He is today a postdoctoral research associate with Professor Brandon S. Cooper at the University of Montana. Dr. Nitin's work on Indian butterflies has taken him to almost all parts of India, including neighboring places to Bangalore like the Western Ghats and Kerala, as well as remote locations in the Northeastern states, Western Himalayas, and even the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. His journey has been marked with several achievements. He has authored a much acclaimed research paper titled The Larval Host Plants uh, of Butterflies of the Western Ghats. He, along with Mr. Ashok Sengupta, Hanish Kayam, and Rohit Girotra, co-founded the Bangalore Butterfly Club, a citizen science initiative to promote the awareness about butterflies as well as the study and scientific documentation of the butterflies in Karnataka. He, along with Dr. Krishna Kunte, has co-authored the book Butterflies of Bengaluru, as well as a brochure on the butterflies of Bengaluru. Dr. Nitin is an encyclopedia of knowledge, and over the last uh, several years, he has selflessly and passionately shared his knowledge with his fellow colleagues, other scientists, and public at large. His ability to communicate, communicate complex topics in an easy to understand language and his patient approach to help another person learn make him a pleasure to listen to. And many have benefited from his sharing. Dr. Nitin is joining us today from the US to give us today's expert talk on butterfly stories, what scientists have learned about the world's favorite insect. Thank you, Nitin, for taking the time from your busy schedule to be here with us and looking forward to your talk. And viewers, before we start, just a reminder to keep yourself muted and keep your videos off during the session. Thank you. Yes, Nitin, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Priya, for that introduction. It feels very weird to, you know, uh, stay all of that, but yeah. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen and done. Uh, is my audio working? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. Hey everyone. Uh good evening. And yeah, it's pretty early in the morning here at 6 30, but I'm really excited to talk to you guys about uh what scientists have been studying so far. And I want to highlight five stories which I think applies to a lot of Indian butterflies as well. So today's talk is titled Butterfly Stories, What Scientists Have Learned Studying the World's Favorite Insects. So to begin with, why even study butterflies? There are multiple reasons as to why studying butterflies is important. The most important thing is their ecological significance. Butterflies are incredibly great pollinators and they support uh, biodiversity by being uh, a uh, providing pollination services, as well as being food sources to a variety of organisms, such as birds, uh, uh, reptiles, and so on and so forth. And they are also great indicators of ecosystem health uh, and monitoring ecosystem health uh, in general. Uh, apart from the ecological significance, butterflies also have a huge symbolic importance for human beings uh, and mankind in general. Uh, butterflies and uh, uh, and stories about butterflies have been inter intertwined with cultures across the world from time immemorial. A lot of 
stories, a lot of uh, poems, a lot of uh, metaphors have been related to butterflies and their uh, life has been intertwined with us for a very long time. And they also serve as really important conservation value. And like I said before, they are great indicators of environmental health and uh, understanding butterfly populations uh, have helped scientists understand uh, the impact of climate change in a variety of habitats and uh, to understand how to protect the environment better. Apart from all of uh, the applied uh, uh, aspects of studying butterflies, studying butterflies itself has a lot of scientific uh, potential. And that's because uh, studying butterflies helps us understand how colors are made, how development uh, occurs in, uh, in an organism as butterflies have very complex developmental patterns. And uh, studying butterflies have also helped uh, effective bioengineering, for example, uh, nanostructures uh, based out of butterfly wing structures or optics using butterfly eyes or you know uh, uh, designing effective solar uh, chips based on how butterflies use their wings to heat up their body. So this talk is uh, divided into three parts and each part has a few stories that I'm going to tell. So the whole uh, uh, presentation is going to be uh, you know, a, a story format to make uh, the science easier to people who do not have a biology background. So the first one, uh, the first part of the talk is the lessons that scientists have learned uh, from studying butterflies in the field. So the way a scientist uh, studies butterflies in the field is that they have a particular hypothesis they want to test. And this can range from understanding how is uh, temperature affecting the population of a single species of butterfly or temperature affecting the whole community of butterflies to how is uh, climate change affecting butterflies or how is flower abundance or flower uh, density affecting butterflies and so on and so forth. So the scientists first comes up with a hypothesis and then they go into the field with uh, a specific methodology and they observe butterflies either in for just a season uh, or across seasons and sometimes even across decades. So uh, the Bangalore Butterfly Club has been, uh, Rohit Girotra initially and then followed by Nageshwar has been collecting butterfly data for almost 10 to 12 years now. So all of these are going to help scientists understand how uh, butterflies are, uh, butterfly populations are changing based on whatever hypothesis we want to test. So the first story comes from Australia, and this is understanding how wildfire affects butterflies. So I chose this particular story because India is a country which experiences a lot of wildfires throughout uh, various times of the year. And uh, the forest department practices a lot of uh, prescribed burning or controlled burning to control these forest fires. And I have I had a lot of people ask me, oh, you know, when we burn this, patch of habitat, what's going to happen to the butterflies? Are they going to just, uh, is it not going to affect them badly? Is it not going to kill all their host plants? Is it not going to kill uh, their you know, larvae stages or their pupae and so on and so forth? So I realized, I, I thought this would be a good story to share, share with uh, you today. So this was a study that was published very recently about a few months ago. And this comes from uh, work that was done about uh, three years in uh, Australia uh, at the Territory Wildlife Park. So in the Territory Wildlife Park, uh, there are uh, the scientists uh, realized that there are uh, areas that have differences in their in the time that they're they're burnt usually habitat you know places in the habitat that were burnt in at different times. So they divided the habitat into three different blocks and each uh, block had multiple one hectare plots. And in that, what they had was there were multiple subsections in which some of the uh, plots were burnt every year, some were burnt every two years, some were burnt every uh, two years, but later in the season, and some were burnt once every five years and some were not burnt at all. So those served as controls. And they were interested in understanding three different uh, questions. So first one was, 
uh, how does burning affect the number of individuals that are present in each of these habitats? And then how does uh, burning affect uh, the number of species that are there in each habitat? And finally, how diverse is a community of butterflies in areas that were burnt versus in areas that were not burnt? So the first thing that uh, they answered was uh, looking at how many individuals were there in areas that were burnt early, areas that were burnt late in the season, or areas that were never burnt at all. And surprisingly, what they found was that uh, so the x-axis here, E is for early, L is for late, and U is for unburnt. And butterfly abundance is the number of butterflies that is there in the habitat. And what they found was that uh, in areas which uh, experienced burning early during the season and more frequently, that is every year, there was a much higher butterfly abundance compared to areas where burning never occurred. So burning or prescribed burning or controlled burning is critically important to increase the number of butterflies uh, in an area. And that also translated to higher species richness. So on average, areas which were burnt early during the season compared to either late or never burnt at all had higher butterfly species richness compared to areas Sorry, areas that were burnt early during the season had higher species richness, and areas that were never burnt had very low species richness. And the final thing that is a very important metric for a lot of ecologists is looking at community composition. And this is what we call uh, evenness. So to explain evenness to you, let's consider two areas. So if you consider a paddy field, which contains just paddy or rice, throughout a one hectare plot. And if you compare the same one hectare plot in a rich evergreen Western Ghats forest, you see that one hectare in an evergreen forest contains hundreds and hundreds of species of multiple individuals. Whereas your paddy field only has like probably a million or not a million, like probably a few thousands of paddy fields, but paddy plants, but just of one species. So in this, what we would call, we would call that the evenness of paddy field is higher and the evenness of Western Ghats uh, one hectare is lower. That means it's more rich. And the lower the number, the richer the habitat or the richer the composition of the butterfly community is there. And what they found was that the butterfly, uh, butterfly communities were more diverse in areas which were burnt every year compared to areas that were rarely burnt or never burnt. So overall, this study highlighted the importance of fire or controlled fire in shaping butterfly populations or butterfly species richness. And uh, before, you know, humans, uh, human populations exploded the way it is right now, uh, there used to be fires frequently, there used to be wildfires frequently in nature. And the whole communities of butterflies, plants, and every other organism, especially in the tropical areas, have adapted to responding to fire or responding to periodic controlled fire. So when you burn or when you do a controlled burn or a prescribed burn in an area, what happens is that the entire area gets replenished and you have higher number of plants, higher number of uh, nectar sources for the butterflies in the next season. And that actually helps support and sustain a lot more varieties of butterflies, a lot more species of butterflies and a lot more number of butterflies. So uh, in the Western Ghats, when I was doing a lot of field work, I've seen uh, the forest department doing a lot of controlled burns, which are incredibly important to maintaining uh, the ecosystem. But this, you know, this is not the same as someone, you know, uh, someone going out there with their cigarette and then, you know, not turning out the flame and just burning down the entire forest in the middle of the season. That is a very bad practice. Whereas early in the season, controlled burns are incredibly important to maintain butterfly communities. And I realized that this is a really good uh, example, which can be, you know, applied to a lot of Indian butterflies and Indian butterfly communities as well. So moving on, the second story uh, that I'm going to talk about is to address what happens when you uh, introduce butterflies to new habitats. And this is the question that I've gotten uh, from a lot of people, at least in the last, you know, multiple times in the last 10 years. 
and i chose this particular story to highlight uh the you know the impacts of uh introduced butterflies in new habitats and this is a study that i was personally involved in and it's under review and it should be published in the next few months so uh there's a background story to this uh, particular study and i think you know people will be interested in uh, hearing about that so this butterfly called Euphytrius gilletii or Gillette's checker spot is a butterfly that's found across uh, Western United States. And uh, it's uh, mostly restricted to high altitude mountains across uh, the whole Rocky Mountain area. But it, it, uh, and its distribution ranges from northern uh, southern Canada till Wyoming, which is a state in the uh, western part of uh, uh, USA. And in 1977, uh, a very famous butterfly biologist uh, named uh, Paul Ehrlich, you know, had a bet with one of his colleagues, uh, you know, uh, to see what would happen if they introduced a butterfly into a different habitat. So he was looking at what butterfly to, uh, what do you call, uh, introduce into a particular habitat. And he was based out of uh, Colorado, the name of the place is Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, the same place where I did all of my fieldwork for my PhD. And he was comparing the habitat of Rocky Mountain Biological Lab uh, to uh, multiple habitats across the Western United States. And he found that this one particular butterfly, which is the Gillette's checker spot, had the perfect habitat to be introduced into the Rocky, into the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab surroundings. So what he did was that he had a private plane. So he flew over to uh, Wyoming. Uh, he collected tons and tons of uh, butterfly larvae, uh, butterfly eggs, got them to uh, uh, what do you call, uh, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab in Colorado, read them up till uh, when they were, till they were like third or fourth in star, flew them in the plane, and then from the plane dumped around 10,000 larvae in the habitat where he thought they would do very well. And this was in 1977. So the first two or three years, he did not see any butterflies at all over there. And he thought that the experiment had failed. But then slowly in the 1980s, people started seeing a few individuals of this species, uh, you know, popping up uh, in that area where he had uh, released all the 10,000 larvae. And by 2000s, they had established a good population in that one small two hectare area in uh, the biological uh, station. And ever since 1977 till as recent as last year, uh, Paul Ehrlich and then my, my advisor, uh, Carol Boggs, have been studying this population uh, every summer. And the population of this butterfly has varied from about 40 individuals per hectare to almost 2,000 individuals per hectare. So the population keeps varying and they have no natural predators. I mean, they have a lot of predators there, but they are they were never present in this part of uh, the Rocky Mountains. They're only present in the northern part. And the reason why he introduced uh, this particular butterfly was that this butterfly, uh, the host plant of this butterfly called uh, Lonicera involucrata, or the twinberry honeysuckle was very abundant in the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And the mountain surface also supported uh, a lot more, a lot of the other factors such as snow melt timing, the amount of sunlight is it received during the morning, and so on and so forth. So what Carol uh, has been uh, doing is trying to understand the impacts of this butterfly on the native uh, plant populations. And so in this study, what we did was we uh, so the pink dots here represent areas where the butterflies are present and the black dots here represent areas where the butterflies are not present, where the butterflies are not there, but the habitat resembles exactly, you know, matches the uh, yes. butterfly present uh, sites as much as possible. And, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so what I was interested in looking at was understanding what are the short-term impacts of introduced butterflies into new habitats and what are the long-term uh, effects of introducing these uh, short 
uh, 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 what are the long term effects of introducing these butterflies into new habitats and uh, this is not a invasive butterfly per se because it is native to the us but just to a different portion of the us and it's uh, the host plant was there so you know uh, uh, that's the reason it was introduced here and we did a lot of modeling and we uh, the experiment you know we did was basically going out i did not do the experiment per se because it was done in between 2004 and 2011 when i was still a kid so what uh, they did was they went out and they looked at uh, they measured the plant uh, characteristics such as looking at the number of uh, leaves that it had number of stems that it had number of seed it produced what was the volume of the plant and another thing that these butterflies do is that they each larvae produces a web around itself to survive over the winter so uh, they counted the number of larval webs every year on how many webs were there on each plant how many webs were there per hectare and so on and so forth so i'm going to share the results of what we found from this study so uh one of the things that attracted butterflies to this particular you know for a particular plant was the number of so okay before i explain the figure i'm going to talk about what the figure talks about so the green arrows ind indicate increase in some metric and the uh, values here indi uh, indicates uh, increase per unit so here if i say that every increase in one shoot or one stem in 2004 increase the number of webs by 0.0087 so that is what this you know uh, value means so what we looked what i looked at was understanding what influenced the number of webs that were present and that was basically the number of stems so if the plant had a lot of stems that uh, basically in increased the number of larval webs in uh, that area and so uh, we were interested in understanding the short term impacts so whatever so when the butterflies were there in 2004 how did it impact the plant in 2005 so what we see here is that higher plant volume relates to higher uh, or larger number of seeds larger number of uh, shoots in, uh, relates to larger number of seeds but if you see the values here the higher the number of webs the higher the number of seeds produced per plant the next year so what's happening here is that introduced butterflies are making plants to produce more seeds so it is impacting way more than what the plant characteristics itself is impacting it and this is a classic uh, you know phenomenon in a lot of uh, herbivore plant interaction studies where when the plant is being munched on by a herbivore it has two choices one is i'm going to go and uh, invest all of my uh, energy in defending myself or i know that i cannot defend myself so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just start investing everything in reproduction so that at least my progeny can survive so that's the case that's happening here because of the presence of this particular butterfly the plant has said okay fine i cannot really tolerate this particular butterfly so i'm going to just not invest in my defenses and i'm going to just make sure that i put as much energy as possible into reproduction and the second thing that i was interested in as was looking at the long term effects so the way we did that was we looked at plant volume and we looked at uh, and we classified plant volume into size class 1 small plant volume medium large and very large plant volume and we this was in 2011 so uh, after all of these years we came back you know we wanted to see how things had changed in areas where the butterflies were present where it was in areas where the butterflies were absent so what this shows is that if you have flowers uh, that are produced every year then the plant size class or the plant becomes bigger and bigger over a period of time which is you know classic which is you know which means that it's doing very well and so the presence of herbivory here is all the native herbivores like there were a lot of other moths that were feeding on it a lot of other beetles that were feeding on it and a lot of other uh, butterfly not a lot of other butterflies that were feeding on this particular host plant and this was measured in areas where the uh, where this particular butterfly had never been introduced before so even with the presence of herbivory the plant size class increased that means the plants uh, had 
locally adapted to whatever butterflies and other native herbivores were present. But wherever this particular butterfly was present, the size class increased dramatically. Uh, that means that over, you know, over a period of time, the size of the plant started shrinking more and more. So what this means is that even though this particular butterfly feeds on this particular host plant in another area, introducing it into a new area has a lot of negative effects to the local plant community. And this is something that I always, you know, that I always try to tell people when they say, oh, you know, we have all of these suitable host plants in Bangalore. Why don't we get butterflies from, you know, Western, Western Ghats or Eastern Himalayas or some other place? And the reason why we should not do that is it can have serious short term as well as long term impacts on native communities. So moving on from this, I'm going to talk about the second part of the story, which is lessons learned from uh, the lab uh, studies. So scientists uh, employ various laboratory techniques to study butterflies. And the simplest of them, or the uh, one that has been employed for a very, very long time, is getting the butterfly into the lab, subjecting them to specific conditions, and then seeing what happens to them. And this, this, these conditions can range from manipulating temperature, manipulating host plant abundance, manipulating nectar abundance, manipulating uh, X, Y, Z density, whatever it can be. So it all depends on what the scientist is interested in. So the story that I'm going to talk about here comes from India, comes from Trivandrum, and this is understanding why some butterflies exhibit multiple colors of pupae, whereas some butterflies do not exhibit uh, you know, various pupil colors. And this was this study was done by uh, Harshad Mayankar and Ulasa from Isotrivandrum, and this was published, I think, uh, literally a month ago. So these, uh, uh, this paper looked at five different species of nymphalids or, uh, you know, saturnine butterflies. So Mycalces minius, which is the dark-branded bush brown, Yptima hubneri, which is the uh, common four-ring, Yptima baldus, the common five-ring, Melanitis leda, common evening brown, Melanitis fedima, which is the dark evening brown. And uh, they chose these five species because they're all closely related to each other in, in, in terms of uh, what kind of plants they feed on, in terms of their life history, and so on and so forth. And from what we know in nature, uh, common evening brown and dark evening brown always have green color pupae. And uh, your uh, uh, common fibering or Yptima baldus has brown color pupae, whereas dark branded bush brown and common four ring have multiple pupil colors ranging from brown to green. So they were interested in three questions. First is to see what proportion of these, uh, uh, the dark branded bush brown and the common four ring exhibit this pupil polymorphism or pupil, you know, uh, multiple colors. And what is the reason for this? And how does life history trait, uh, you know, decide the ability to change colors or match your colors to your background? So the first thing they saw was that when they uh, looked at pupil percentages in the lab, they brought hundreds of butterflies uh, or larvae to the lab and then they reared it uh, to, to the pupae. What they found was that uh, almost all of the uh, evening browns had green pupae. Your common firing only had brown pupae, whereas uh, Mycalces minius, which is your dark granite bush brown and uh, common fouring, had some varying proportions of brown and green. And then they were interested to look at why did this particular uh, green and brown pupae, you know, occur. And what they found was that, so whatever the black bars here uh, show are basically the pupae which went outside of the leaf and pupated somewhere else. So these butterflies had more propensity to move somewhere else and pupate, basically not on a leaf, on some other substrate. And the higher the you know uh, uh, propensity to move outside of the leaf, your chances of you know matching your color to that particular surrounding or the ability to do that had evolved. 
and then they looked at what percentage of butterflies that pupated out of the leaf had brown color was a, what percentage of butterflies that pupated on the leaf had green color and what they saw was that butterflies that had pupated out of the leaf almost always had brown color pupae whereas butterflies that pupated on the leaf almost always had green color pupae so this uh, shows that the butterflies have a spatial awareness to understand what the color of their surroundings are or what is the best strategy for their surroundings is and then basically uh, have the ability to change the color to match the substrate and this begs the question to understand why do these butterflies go out of their habitat or go out of their leaf in the first place and the reason for that is density so when you uh, when you have low density of pup uh, or low density of larvae around they stray away a lot less but if you have a lot more or very high density uh, larvae in a you know in a population then they try to move out of the leaf as much as possible and that re you know uh, relates to the ability to uh, match your surroundings so this basically answers a very you know uh, interesting question about life history evolution in butterflies is that whatever you know patterns you see about either for example you know you when we see common rows of crimson rows they always have brown color pupae and they always pupate outside of their leaf uh and some butterflies like uh, your common mormon or these two butterflies that are shown here they can pupate at multiple locations and they have done that for a very very long time and that's why they have evolved the ability to be able to change colors for, to match their surroundings perfectly and all of this is done to avoid being detected because pupal stages are the most uh, vulnerable stage because they cannot move away from predators so this was a very neat study which uh, i think you know answered a lot of questions that people have when uh, they wanted to or you know that that they have and they look at pupae as to why it matches the color how does it matches match the color and what are the reasons it matches a particular color so the next story again will take you uh, you know i'm going to take you back to the rocky mountain biological lab and i want to highlight the study because it was done by an undergrad who i was training in uh, who i was training during my phd and uh, she she worked with us for four years uh, doing field work whenever you know uh, summer whenever we did our field work in the summer and malia was incredibly interested in understanding or she, one day when we were walking around she came up with the question as to how do butterflies you know is there any relation between butterflies and the bacteria that they interact with in nature so she was specifically interested in understanding where are the microbes present in the butterfly body or on the butterfly body and she wanted to understand if butterflies transfer microbes when they are feeding and uh how does you know the foraging habit of a or a, a, you know foraging behavior of a butterfly affect the microbial abundance on different floret structures so the first thing she did was she looked at uh, multiple species of butterflies and uh, she uh, basically you know uh, she used to run behind a butterfly sit i uh, you know observe the butterfly for a few like about 20 minutes to 30 minutes to see what flowers they were visiting and then catch that butterfly get it to the lab and then you know uh, uh scrub it uh, to look at uh, what kind of bacteria they carried and then look went back to the flower to see what kind of bacteria the flower had and so on so forth she first looked at what was the diversity of bacteria that was present Uh, in the butterflies and the diversity of bacteria that was present in nectar and the reason why this is a very interesting uh, question that she came up with is because uh, okay. butterflies are are not only you know attracted to the nectar or just the color of the flower this you know like a lot of previous studies with bees have shown that the kind of bacterial composition in the nectar also affects how frequently the plant or the flower attracts its pollinators because when you have different bacterial or fungal communities it can uh, change the taste of the nectar and in turn change how uh, what do you call how the uh, health of the uh, 
pollinator also can be then related. And that also has implications in, you know, for example, if a butterfly is sick and if it's carrying a very bad pathogenic bacteria, is it transferring from one flower to other? So this, she was very interested in answering those questions. And then once she had done all of that, she narrowed down to one specific butterfly, which is Spiria mormonia, which is the common uh, mormon fritillary. So she wanted to test if butterflies actively transfer microbes when they are feeding. So to do that, she used to go out in the field, sit at a, you know, a patch, looked at what kind of flowers this particular butterfly is fed on. And fortunately for her, they almost always fed on this one particular species of dandelion throughout their season. So it was very easy to you know uh, manipulate and work with this particular species. So what she did was, so first she got... Uh, she, you know, early in the morning before any pollinator had even come onto a flower, she used to go and bag that flower so that no pollinators visited it. She got the butterflies, put, you know, trained the butterfly to go on to, you know, this particular flower inside, you know, uh, just stay on one particular flower. And then after that, uh, you know, she got the butterfly in the lab, kept the butterfly in the lab for a day, then took it, you know, and then she had one particular strain of bacteria which you know had orange in color which was orange in color which we could easily track so she then applied that uh, uh, uh bacteria uh, into the uh, into a particular flower and then she put the butterfly on that particular flower and then uh, when uh, looked at what it did when it went on to the next flower which is known as the recipient flower and through all of this what she did was she got the uh, flower dissected it so he took different parts of the flower and looked at how much bacteria grew on each of them. So the first one was to look at what kind of back the training in sense was to see what kind of natural bacteria the butterfly carried. And when she already had a particular butterf you know bacteria that we were looking at, which was called Rhodococcus, we wanted to see how much of bacteria from the donor in you know from one flower was carried on to the next flower. And what she found was incredibly interesting. So wing wear is a metric that uh, scientists use to estimate the age of a butterfly. So wing wear four is very old butterfly where your wings are completely tattered, you're about to die soon. Wing wear one is where, you know, you are very, very young. Wing wear two is somewhere, you know, in wing wear two, 2.5, somewhere in the middle of your life stage. And what she found was that for uh, butterflies that are either middle-aged or very old, transmitted a lot more microbes compared to uh, butterflies that were very young or butterflies that were, you know, uh, somewhere in the between like two and four uh, in their wing wear. And this particular species of butterflies, she's tested about five species, three or four species of butterflies and spiria, which is the uh, Mormon fritillary, transmitted more, but more bacteria compared to other butterflies. And naturally, because butterflies use their feet and their proboscis when they are on the uh, flower, they transported a lot more microbes compared to the thorax or the wing tissues. And interestingly, males transported way less microbes compared to females. And all of this show a very interesting pattern where it tells us that micro transfer from butterflies is very dynamic and it depends on a lot of factors. And, uh, you know, Spiria species or this particular species, Nymphalet, it spends a lot of time nectaring, unlike a, a few other butterflies, which just come and sit on a flower, like some Hesperids, skippers, where you see they come very quickly, spend a few seconds and then run away. Whereas some butterflies spend their leisurely time on flowers nectaring. So the amount of time you spend on nectaring uh, can influence how much microbe you transfer. And females generally, you know, uh, uh, transfer more because they uh, pro they spend a lot more time nectaring because nectaring uh, helps them regain the energy that they invest during egg laying. So it's really important for them to do this. And one of the things that we also found in the study is that sometimes the butterflies are indeed, uh, you know, uh, in the nectar samples that we saw, there was one particular species of bacteria that is known to cause infections in butterflies. So potentially, you know, when you have, a, you know, like when you have uh, a new bacteria or a new pathogenic bacteria in the flower or, you know, in, in a new 
plant that you get into the uh, into your house or something if it has a pathogenic bacteria that can be transported across the whole habitat that's around so that's something you know it's like a we we think you know that it, it, the the butterflies have a lot of capacity to transmit microbes across uh, different flowers that they are uh, nectaring so the last part of uh, this talk is the lessons that we have learned from genetics and uh, i do a lot of genetics for my you know, i did a lot of genetics for my phd and even now for my post talk i do a, a ton of uh, genetics but here i'm going to talk about something that i don't uh, that i've never you know that i'm uh, that i don't usually do that is understanding how butterfly wing color shapes or spots arise and almost every one of you who have you know observed butterflies are all you know know how diverse the wing patterns of butterflies are it can vary from multiple colors on a butterfly to a single color on a butterfly iridescent color uh, incredibly intricate patterns and so on and so forth and i don't think there's any other insect out there in the in the world that can help us understand how colors are formed or how different complex patterns are formed you know more than what we can learn from studying butterflies and scientists have been using a lot of genetic tools so when we talk about genetics it can go from looking at their dna to manipulating their dna to editing their genes and so on and so forth and today i'll be talking about gene editing and how gene editing can help us understand butterfly wing pattern so when it comes to wing pattern the way it works is that when the uh, you know uh, larvae is developing in its fifth instar it uh, very early during its fifth instar it has something known as an imaginal disc which starts you know which becomes the wing in the adult when it's in the pupae so the imaginal imaginal disc uh, basically has certain time points and certain genes get switched on during very specific time points to make the color that we see in you know uh, butterflies so before i go on to talking about gene editing i want you know or you know what we found with gene editing i want to talk about gene editing because this is something that you will all hear very much in your day to day life in the next 10 years because this is the next big thing in molecular medicine so this gene editing tool is known as crispr cas9 and you know you don't need to worry about the name and this is termed as the molecular swiss knife because it can do things so precisely and so easily that it was you know before it was this was invented it was almost impossible to be you know employing gene editing at such a large scale so the way we do gene editing or the way people do gene editing in you know in any organism for that matter is that you know you have a particular gene that you're interested in and then you have a you know a particular set of barcodes for you know the gene that you're interested in and then the crispr cas9 is attached to that particular barcode and then you inject that into uh, whatever stage of the butterfly you're interested in and then what it does is the barcode goes uh, to that particular gene either you know above the gene or below the gene and then the crispr cas9 just cuts that dna into pieces and when you do that you can either just let the dna heal on its own because the dna has the capacity to keep you know healing or keep repairing any sort of damages on its own immediately and that results in that gene being taken off completely right when you you know when you cut that gene part uh, you know it either uh, it, it it results in deletions and basically the butterfly then no longer has that particular gene or alternatively what you can do is along with attaching the barcode you can also attach a new gene to that particular barcode and introduce that particular gene so you can introduce new genes into uh, the butterfly that way and with crispr cas9 what people do is that especially to study butterfly development uh, what we what they do is that they take the crispr cas9 with the particular barcode you know uh, uh, sequence and they inject it into a particular stage during you know in the egg which is known as syncytial embryo so this is a stage which is a few hours right after the egg has been laid where the nuclear where the butterflies have still not undergone you know tissue reorganization or anything like that so you just you know inject the crispr cas9 into the uh, egg and then it basically goes and starts cutting up the dna and then it becomes uh, and then what you expect is that some 
of your nucleus or some of your DNA is now edited. And this has worked very well in a lot of butterflies and people have been able to understand what genes are doing when it comes to uh, uh, you know, patterning or wing pattern and so on and so forth. So here I'm gonna show you a few uh, slides about what people have found with uh, manipulating or using gene editing to understand development. So this particular butterfly here is known as uh, Junonia senia or the common buckeye. So what scientists did here was that there is a gene known as ebony, which as the name translates, gives you ebony color. And what they did was in the early you know, butterfly uh, egg stage, they injected the ebony gene uh, knockout. We call it knockout. That means knocking off the gene into the, uh, they did CRISPR-Cas9 on the ebony gene and they knocked it out. So what you see here on the left is how the butterfly would look in the wild. And with the knockout, what you see, instead of having uh, these salmon pink scales, you have this you know very dark brown scales. So this whole area was affected by manipulating or editing that particular gene. So this shows us that this is where ebony gene was acting in the larvae to you know, basically uh, give it this particular pattern. And this is how we understand, okay, fine. If you mess up this gene, this part of the butterfly gets hammered and this is what happens. You know, This is how this particular gene is important for this particular pattern. And when they looked at another gene known as WNT or WINT, they saw that you know when you apply WINT A to the butterfly in its egg stage, it not only you know affects the hind wing, it can also affect multiple parts of the uh, you know fore wing as well. So here, whatever X marks is the one that is you know that's been removed. So you can see here that this butterfly has three bands here, but with the CRISPR knockout, it only has two. And instead of this, instead of having this really nice, you know, uh, wavy pattern here, that pattern is completely absent, and the border is also reduced. So, if we saw this in the wild, we would call it a wing, you know, aberration of, of an individual. So these, you know, mutants occur naturally in the wild, but you can also see what is the cause of these mutants and when did, you know, what is the particular gene that is involved in causing these particular mutations, and CRISPR, you know, this particular wind gene is called as a master regulator because it not only regulates, uh, you know, patterns like these, it can also regulate incredibly diverse, you know, patterns and shapes and so on and so forth. So what they did here was, this is another fritillary, which is very common in Southeastern United States. So they injected CRISPR-Cas9 into this butterfly. So on the left is your wild type where you have all of these black spots here, and these very pretty silver spots. And when you have that wind a knockout, so all of the green and blue here has been knocked out. That means it's completely changed. So there is more expression of, you know, there's very haphazard expression of this wind a gene, you know, or a particular silver gene here, which is extending here. And wind a has not worked here and so on and so forth. So it not only affects on one particular color of a gene, it affects multiple colors. It can affect how you know the entire butterfly looks like, and sometimes it can have dramatic effects. And another butterfly that they tried was our very known, uh, our you know very well known painted lady, and the mosaic pattern that we see in painted lady is also controlled by Vente. So when you knock that out, when you know you can see that the butterflies look different. And in some species of butterflies, Vinte can also have effects simultaneously on the upper side as well as the underside. So this is a wood brown, which is uh, commonly found in uh, a lot of parts of the temperate uh, regions of the world. And when they injected once, you know, uh, injected Vinte once, it affected both the upper side as well as the underside. So. This is incredibly important because now we have the tools to go to the completely, you know, molecular mechanisms of understanding how butterfly colors are made, how butterfly development occurs, how these interesting patterns are, you know, uh, uh, shaped in butterflies from species to species. And the surprising thing that, you know, scientists found was that 
a lot of these different wing patterns are controlled by very few number of genes. So you can see your, you know, your uh, Setosia, uh, uh, Maharata, which is your uh, lace wing, the Sayadri lace wing, and the Western Guards, which are such beautiful patterns. All your, or your Tino Palpus Imperialis, which is the Kesare in the north, in the northeast Himalayas, which have completely beautiful iridescent green patterns. And both of these patterns are controlled by the same, you know, family of genes. Either it could be Vente or, you know, another, uh, a few set of genes. So same genes are having multiple different effects in different butterflies. And that was a very important finding that people or, you know, scientists, you know, found that, yes, it does not require a lot of genes or a lot of, you know, species-specific genes to give out these spectacular colors. All you need is a master regulator that based on, you know, evolution, uh, it's, you know, uh, whatever pigment, pigments is there in the butterfly and so on and so forth can lead to different and beautiful diversity of colors. So before I conclude, I know uh, a lot of people ask me specifically as to why do we even study butterflies? What is the point of studying butterflies? How is it helping humankind? And if there's no point, you know, if the butterflies don't help humankind, what is the point of even investing in studying butterflies? The first and foremost is uh, studying butterflies helps understand biodiversity and ecosystem health and researchers by monitoring butterflies, by understanding how climate change impacts butterflies and so on and so forth, can gain a better understanding of biodiversity and the overall health of ecosystems. And uh, with butterflies being very important pollinators, you know, understanding the complex relationships between plants <clears throat> and butterflies is very crucial because it helps us understand the reproductive biology of a lot of plant species, including a lot of species that we depend on for our food. For example, a lot of crops and a lot of you know fruit trees and fruit fruit plants are all pollinated by insects. And understanding butterflies can help us effectively manage them for a sustainable future. And they have one of you know butterflies form one of the most complex you know uh, part of ecological relationships because they interact with tons and tons of organisms. Butterflies interact with plants, they interact with other you know, organisms that eat them, they interact with parasites like bacteria or fungi or parasitoid wasps. And we can understand how ecosystem functions because of these. And this is incredibly important because this can help us to effectively manage agriculture, forestry, or, you know, uh, threatened habitat and so on and so forth. And like I said, bioindicators. Butterflies are great bioindicators because they require very specific host plants. They require very specific temperature regimes and so on and so forth. So you can understand what uh, eco, you know, what stress an ecosystem is facing based on uh, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on studying butterflies. And like I said, you know, CRISPR, so CRISPR-based technology is going to be the next big thing in you know, understanding human diseases in the next 20, 15 to 20 years. And there is nothing better than using butterflies to understand CRISPR for human beings. Because, you know, for example, some of the things that CRISPR can be used for, uh, used in humans is, let's say, you know, you, you, you know about sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, which are all caused by mutation, you know, defects in single genes. And CRISPR can be effectively used to help human beings or cure those diseases and even some cancers for that matter. <clears throat> and understanding how CRISPR works, you know, in complex, you know, complex patterns such as wing development or other, you know, host plant detection and so on and so forth can help us translate this knowledge directly into understanding human diseases or, under or being able to cure human diseases. So it's incredibly important to study butterflies, at least from this, uh, you know, uh, point of view. And additionally, a lot of biotechnology or biomimicry has been using butterflies to, you know, and it has applications in nanotechnology, optics, flight, and so on and so forth. And finally, butterflies are important because by studying them, we can, you know, uh, target conservation, target the conservation of endangered species and conservation of threatened ecosystems. So I hope I've convinced you that it's important for humans to study butterflies and studying butterflies is 
critical for us as a man, you know, as a species in general and our you know, future uh, as well. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take. I'm not sure how much time I've taken, but yeah, uh, uh, feel free to ask me any questions. I'll be more than happy to answer them right now. Yes, then we have a few questions from the viewers. Uh, the first question is from Rohit. The question is regarding the first story. So what happens when an area is burned, that is controlled burn? What causes the increase in butterfly population and the increase in butterfly species? All right. So whenever you have, uh, what do you call it? Whenever you have, whenever you burn an area, so you're burning carbon, right? You're burning carbon, you're burning nitrogen, you're burning the plants that are a, have overgrown or plants that have, uh, you know, so if you burn an area like, you know, if you do a controlled burn in an area like JPRF, which already has very dense populations of plants and so on and so forth, the soil has already, uh, you know, been depleted of a lot of uh, minerals and uh, important components that the butterfly, that, you know, plants need to grow. So when you burn them, you're returning all of those resources back to the soil. So the next season, you see even more flowers, even more, uh, you know, resources for butterflies, and that in, in turn increases butterfly abundance. And this has been shown across different ecosystems. <clears throat> A lot of grasslands in India, uh, where they've shown that carbon, you know, uh, uh, content increases after a periodic, you know, periodic burning, and nitrogen content increases after periodic burning, and flower richness increases after periodic burning, and so on and so forth. So that's why, uh, especially in tropical habitats, where the soil itself, you know, is already saturated because of a huge species diversity. It definitely benefits uh, the ecosystem to have these controlled, you know, what do you call, uh, replenishment of the soil as well as the species composition, uh, plant species composition that occurs. Yeah. So, so it's about the uh, what it does to the plants that they feed on, which yeah. in turn yeah. results yeah. in. There. Yeah, so it impacts the plants directly and the plants then impact butterflies directly because they have more nectar, they have more uh, plant for their, you know, for their uh, caterpillars and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah. The next question uh, from Swati, what will the butterflies do during control fire? Do they instinctively, re sorry, this is from Sebi. What will the butterflies do during control fire? Do they instinctively move out of the area or get per perished? So it's it both can happen. Some butterflies, you know, when they're in their adult stages, they can escape the uh, fire and they can then go around and then move to a different habitat and lay a lot of eggs and replenish that. If they are pupae, they're almost always, you know, they perish there. If they are larvae, depending upon what stage of the larvae they are in and how near they are to the periphery of the fire, they can either get, you know, survive, they can either survive or they can get killed. So it does both. It controls both the population of insects and uh, replenishes the plant population as well. So both can happen. So depending on how fast they can move out of the fire, either yeah. they perish or survive. Yeah. Okay. The next question uh, by Joy. Are the eggs, larvae, some, larvae somehow surviving or thriving during the control fires? I think that's kind of answered in your uh Thing. So the eggs will also survive if there is uh, the smoke. Uh, the fire does not no. egg immediately touch, so or if the heat also kill them. There are some eggs, you know, species of, you know, I think there are one or two butterfly egg species which were, you know, where eggs or butterfly species which lay their eggs on the ground, and those can actually survive fire because sometimes they have the capacity to survive fire, and that is, those species have specifically evolved to coexist with periodic fires in their habitat and those can survive but otherwise you know usually they just perish okay and the next question uh sorry just a minute from sangeeta how is the population balanced given that there are no natural predators for checker spot so uh the population is managed by two things one is their genetic diversity itself so remember i told you that Paul Oleg just caught about 10,000 larvae and dropped it from an airplane. So when you have just 10,000 larvae, that's a, not a lot of you know genetic diversity that exists in the population. So that 
causes a lot of inbreeding depression inbreeding depression over a few generations or a few decades and that in that in turn maintains the population so that controls the population size from a few individuals to a few thousand and the second thing especially in these you know uh, mountain habitat even in you know western himalayas a lot of the population is controlled by previous year snow pre previous year snow melt previous year uh, uh winter temperature and so on and so forth so we have we know that temperature drives a lot of the population dynamics and uh, that in itself controls the population okay the next question from swati are there any observations where we see wallbackias infestation uh, on butterflies and their change in behavior such as nectaring and affecting fitness of an individual yes there is a lot of evidence. so wolbachia is this butterfly is this bacteria that's present in butterflies and it's transmitted from mom to uh, you know their offspring and wolbachia does a lot of things one of which is basically killing all the males so if you if a female has wolbachia all of her male eggs are killed only the female eggs you know then are uh, propagated and uh, what we know is that when a butterfly is infected with wolbachia it it changes the behavior in terms of what kind of you know habitat it chooses what kind of temperature it likes and what kind of plants it can go to and so on and so forth and this is something that i'm actively working on right now and i'll be testing those next summer in india to see how particular species of butterflies for example your uh pseudo zizeria maha i don't remember the common name uh yeah the uh, the pale grass blue yes i'm i'll be studying pale grass blues and common grass yellows to see how their behavior and their population changes because of wolbachia next question uh from sangeeta jain does the butterfly die on doing crispr cas9 so the way we do crispr cas9 is we get the you know uh, we don't do it in the wild so all of the crispr cas9 is done under laboratory conditions in very very specific you know containment uh, areas they never escape the lab so what we do is we get the eggs and we inject about 1000 or 2000 eggs of butterflies and in that maybe about like 50 to 60% of them carry the mutants and that, you know depending upon how skilled the person doing the uh, injection is they can kill the egg or they will not affect the egg so there are you know when someone is learning crispr they will definitely kill a lot of eggs but as you get better and better uh, you don't necessarily kill the eggs and the crispr cas9 so if you are <clears throat> knocking out a very important gene for example if you're knocking out their glucose gene then none of them will survive but wing patterning gene you know is something that they can you know they're not really harmed by and therefore you know you can uh, knock the gene out and still not kill the butterfly but if you try to in, you know uh, mess with very important functions such as breathing such as uh, reproduction I mean reproduction is still fine breathing or glucose you know conversion or its insulin then you are basically introducing uh, or basically killing the butterfly a lot more so it will depend on which gene you are working on yeah it all depends on the gene So next question by Sebi does gene KO in eggs affect colors of the caterpillars So if you are particularly targeting the colors of you know if you, uh, for example you know Vente is not or you know Ebony or Vente is not involved in coloration of caterpillars it's some other gene So if you ma manipulate that gene then the uh, uh caterpillar color changes So that is the really you know important you know amazing thing about CRISPR is that it is very very specific so you you know you know that gene a causes this effect in a you know organism you edit that gene you only see that effect so if your gene if your interest if your gene of interest is to look at wing patterning in adults and you know that the gene is only expressed in adults you knock it out even in the egg or in the larvae it does not really matter until unless it's expressed in the adult and that is why it has very important implications in human health for example we know that you know you know like uh, diabetes for example it, it's caused by insulin resistance or the gene not working so you want to not mess it up when the baby is born because the baby probably has really good functioning of the insulin gene but when the baby grows up to be an adult of 40 or 35 years is when usually 
diabetes kicks in, you can basically inject uh, a functioning copy of your insulin gene to the adult and cure that person of diabetes. These, these are all, you know, things that are going to be there in the next 20 years where CRISPR is, because it's so specific, can be used, uh, you know, and for a lot of human diseases. Uh, next one from Rekha. On gene editing, they might change the survival tactics from the predator. So what is the aim of such changes by experimentation? So we are not, you know, exp uh, so again, when we uh, do these CRISPR knockouts, we are just interested in understanding what genes are controlling, wing patterning and so on and so forth. And we don't really release them outside, so we don't know what is happening with the predators. but Again, what you know in the future, I know people are already planning experiments where they want to, for example, we know eye spots have very important implications in helping butterflies escape uh, uh, predators or you know, for example, yeah. So what people can, you know, what we can do is uh, we know eye spots are controlled by uh, Vinte and another gene, and you can knock that gene out, create butterflies where no eye spots are there, and then get a predator into the lab and test to see how eye spots have, you know, how much of protection does eye spots actually provide. So, you know, we don't know that answer. I mean, we know that eye spots are important and uh, they have a role in anti-predatory defense, but we will be able to answer a lot more and quantify it with CRISPR in, you know, in the future when we start doing this. Okay, next uh, from Puneet, they might change the survival tactics from the predator. So what is the aim of such changes by experimentation? We just I just answered this question, I think. Yeah. So next one from Sangeeta. You said that the honeysuckle produces more seeds. Is the same thing happen does the same thing happen in case of lantana? Lantana is a nectar plant for many species. So honeysuckle, the butterfly is actively chewing on honeysuckle, whereas lantana, it's just nectaring. So uh if there is a predator or if there is a herbivore that feeds on lantana, which lantana is not evolved to, then it might, again, it all depends on its species specific. Lantana might say that, you know, I can actually handle this predator, so I'll invest a lot more in defenses and then do fine without having to increase the number of seeds it produces. And even so, for example, you know, it's always a trade-off. So when Lonicera or the honeysuckle is producing a lot of seeds, these seeds are not of great quality. These are, you know, smaller seeds. These seeds have less nutrition in them and so on and so forth. So there's a trade-off. So whereas lantana is, the problem with, uh, you know, lantana is that uh, we really don't know how native herbivores are interacting to it or how native herbivores, you know, uh, are affected by it. So again, you know, this is something that people can work on uh, in India to see how, uh, lantana responds to being eaten by indigo flash or slate flash or one of the other butterflies that it feeds uh, that feeds on lantana uh, the next one from saji uh, some butterflies like ring butterflies the uh, i'm not sure how to pronounce this the yphima yeah. species have seen so many aberrations in the western guards any reason for that yeah, it's like I said, it's all the so a lot of these aberrations that you see in the nature are because of mutations in the genes in the wing patterning genes. So uh, these occur naturally, and although in nature you you know sometimes you see dramatic effects where you like you know if you look, go to iPhoneButterflies.org and if you see some of the aberrations, you see that they absolutely do not look like the butterflies they're supposed to, and this happens because. Uh, during their development, naturally, they have a fault in their, you know, in one of these wing patterning genes, and that basically messes up their wing patterns. And that's the reason you see aberrations. And by doing CRISPR, we can understand what gene is causing that aberrations and what gene is specifically uh, responsible for it. So why would that gene aberration happen, actually, in, in so nature? That is because, you know, again, you know, uh, it's... Uh, there are multiple things. One is, you know, let's say that the uh, uh, butterfly, when it was a egg or a larvae, had some virus, and the virus attacked the butterfly, and that, you know, ham that attacked uh, the DNA of the butterfly, and for some reason, it just uh, cut out 
uh, the wing patterning gene, or it could be that they did not get a lot of good nutrition and that caused a lot of DNA damage, or it was exposed to very harsh climatic conditions, a lot of temperature, a lot of UV light, which can cause a lot of da DNA damage. So anything that can cause DNA damage, for example, you know, when we eat a lot of grilled uh, food or a lot of, you know, so fast food, we are actually, uh, you know, Amazing. putting a lot of things in our mouth that is DNA damaging, which is basically like a carcinogen kind of a thing. So if you have something like that, you know, affecting the butterfly early on during its development, it can then cause natural aberrations. So the diet they do also can cause these. Yeah. So the diet. The, so for example, when you know you have a, uh, you have rice fields where you know that a lot of rice fields have pesticides sprayed on them when the butterflies ingest their pesticide ingest the pesticides that can then affect their dna and then damage the dna and by chance if the dna damage does not kill them but just affects their wing patterning genes that leads to aberrations okay thank you the next one uh, the muted ones are able to produce some trait expression gene of things after crispr sorry what was the question again the mutant ones are able to pro means are they able to produce the uh, same trait expression yeah. gene of friends after so, CRISPR? So, uh, if let's say you have one mutant which has uh, which where we have done the CRISPR on them and there is no gene for that wing patterning thing, and then you mate it with a normal butterfly or a butterfly that is regular, it will be fine because all butterflies or all you know most eukaryotes that means most animals and plants are deployed that means we have two sets of genes one from our mom one from our dad so if you have one functional copy it will be fine but if you have both the mutants you know if you have both mom and dad uh mutated then that will be passed on to the offspring anything could you stop screen sharing uh okay. just a second Let's see stop sharing yeah yeah, the next question is, uh, sir, could you please tell about the butterfly reintroduction, sorry, one, reintroduction to areas where they aren't able to recolonize naturally? Thank you so much. Wonderful talk that uh, highlighted interesting questions. So again, it, so if you're talking about, you know, reintroducing butterflies where they were, you know, present before, for example, we know that we have uh, a few butterflies which have gone locally extinct. So if you do that, uh, that should be fine because the plants and the native habitats have already, you know, evolved to uh, coexist with those particular butterfly species. But if you, you know, reintroduce a butterfly species, for example, let's say we want to bring in uh, Kesare Hind to Bangalore and have, you know, all of its host plant planted here, that is not going to do well because that's going to impact the butterfly very badly. Whereas if you, you know, let's say, you know, let's assume that uh, we back in the day we had Medus brown, that is Ostrotrina Medus. We th those were very common in you know Bangalore, at least in the outskirts of Bangalore. And now we have not seen them for almost ten years. So if you introduce those, I think they'll do fine because they have already co-evolved or they have evolved to coexist with the native uh, plants, and the native plants can take that. So it all depends on what you're doing, what your uh, what your you know what do you call what is the reason for your reintroduction? If you're just doing it to bring in more butterflies which are not there, bad idea. If you're doing it to uh, prevent local extinctions, I think that'll be fine. Okay. Okay, uh, next question by Rohit. So has controlled habitat burning been accepted as a scientific way of improving butterfly numbers and number of species, especially in India? Can we, for example, recommend this for JPRF? If yes, what would be the best time to go in for controlled habitat burning? So uh, controlled burning is being done by the forest department across India in a lot of habitats. And it's not just butterflies. It increases the overall health of the ecosystem in general. And specifically, JPRF can benefit a lot because A, it's, in a, you know, it's inside the city, even though it supports a lot of really great butterflies and has a lot of really great uh, you know plants around it the one thing with tropical ecosystems is that there is very little uh you know what do you call availability of excess nutrients in the soil because there's so much of diversity that everything is already used up so controlled burning definitely helps with uh, uh you know increasing butterfly abundance or increasing the overall health in fact you know at least in 
So uh, to give you an example, in the US, the Native Americans used to do a lot and lot and lot of controlled burns every year in, in, in a lot of forests. But when the you know Europeans came here, they banned the uh, Native Americans from doing them and they punished them. And because of that, what happens is that there's a lot of very old growth forest forests that have, you know, uh, where the trees have grown so much, where they are no longer, you know, able to sustain themselves. And when you have a simple wildfire, instead of just affecting a small area, it's like it just affects huge areas and causes massive destructions more than what it's supposed to. And I think the forest department is doing a great job in India with controlled burns and prescribed burns, especially in, in a lot of areas in the Western Ghats, which I've personally seen. And uh, in terms of when the burning should be done, that is something that I think, especially with JPRF, we can address it very easily because we have so much data with butterflies. And the best time to do controlled burning is during the dry season, early dry season before, when you know, population, uh, is less, sir. population is less when all of the you know plants are already starting to lose their leaves and they're drying up perfect timing you know uh, set up a perimeter uh, do a control burn the next year it's going to be perfect so would uh, would this uh, like can they can an alternate to this be to introduce nutrients into the soil or it, this is bet much better sorry what was the question uh, like you said control burning will also help the nutrients to uh, you know get uh, replenished in the soil also right yeah. because of the what is burned yeah. i'm saying is there is 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 there uh, like an alt is an alternative to uh, not do the burning but replenish the soil with some nutrients similar nutrients would it be an alternative to the same thing so the problem with that what's the uh, difference you know, the problem with that approach is that let's say you put in a fertilizer so you're basically talking about adding fertilizers the thing with fertilizers is that the soil cannot take in uh, fertilizers the way it, it takes in natural you know carbon decomposition or nitrogen decomposition and what happens when you add in fertilizers is that whenever it rains it just takes away all the uh, you know fertilizers that has been applied onto the soil Which and that can yeah then go into our natural lakes and natural bodies and then cause even more havoc whereas the burnt ash that stays in the ground and that's a much safer and better alternative if you ask organic me. yeah yeah thank you okay uh yeah i think that question is done i have a question um you had we were talking about uh, the genes uh you know uh controlling the wing patterns uh so now right now whatever butterflies are uh, mimics are doing so because of the transfer from the parent and so on, which is already set there. So the allele is going from the parents to the next in the line. So when do you think the first mimicry would have happened? Like when did the first butterfly, like how, 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 do, how because we're saying this mimics this, right? So yeah. how did that first start off? So and when do you think it would have started? Off? Yeah. So the best person to answer this is Krishna Make because he has basically spent his entire life trying to understand mimicry. But again, based on whatever I've learned from Krishna Make, this is what I can tell you. So let's say, you know, it, it all depends on ev evolution. So for example, if you look at Krishna Make has, you know, published a lot of incredibly amazing papers on these. So uh, the Western Ghats, you know, mimicry rank, for example, with crimson rose, common rose and the common Mormon forms. So the way we look at it is see how old, how, when did the species themselves evolve? So these evolved probably a few, uh, hundreds of thousands or a few millions of years ago. And the way, you know, they start mimicking is there is one random mutation for some reason. So the thing about genetics is that there's always random mutations happening, you know, in nature all the time, even with human beings, for example, you know, uh, like why do we look different compared to what uh, people in uh, Europe uh, look like, or anything like? That's all because of, you know, random mutations that occurred a long time ago that were selective, so you have a random mutation that occurs and then that has a benefit and that, you know, then builds up onto another mutation, another mutation. So once you have the first mutation, it's easier for additional mutations to occur, which then resemble, uh, you know, whatever uh, butterfly model it, it wants to mimic. And the first mimic would be a very bad mimic, like uh, absolutely bad mimic. You know, if, if I had to imagine the common Mormon uh, stickiest form would not resemble the... Uh, 
uh, common uh, rose properly. It would just have a very faint white band, but that had higher chance of survival compared to those that did not have it. So maybe those then, you know, bred more and more and passed on its genes. And then there was another mutation on top of that particular white mutation that increased the band and that, you know, basically helped it perfect its mimicry, mimicry patterns. So, uh, like now, genetically or according to the environment, okay, maybe the, uh, you know, there are changes or the mutations happen according to what is there in the environment. But how does it pick up on how another one looks? I didn't get that. It, how does it, it know does what not, to it, mimic? It does not get, actively do it. It does not actively know it. It just happens by chance. Okay. So, and that is how natural selection works. So natural selection or evolution is not directed towards perfecting something. It's very random. You know, something happens. If it if it is uh, beneficial, it stays. If it's not beneficial, it goes. So all of these are by accident. But, you know, the thing with the... So, uh, you know, the way we think about it is that uh, Occam's razor, you know, basically it's like uh, we say that, okay, fine. If the easiest way for a butterfly to... Uh, protect itself is to, you know, uh, show it on its wings. And the, the way they do it is the very few colors that are known to signal toxicity, like bright red, bright orange, bright, you know, whatever color. So once they have that mutation to get that color, uh, you'll have a population of butterflies which vary in the amount of bright red or bright orange that they have. And only the ones that are uh, very beneficial are the ones that keep, you know, it's like selecting better and better. So if I have to give a example, you know, in the way humans understand is that uh, thousands of years ago, humans started, you know, cultivating rice or wheat. The first rice or wheat was not, does not resemble what it is today. What it is today is basically, you know, incredibly carbohydrate rich or, you know, have all the nutrients, but the first one was very poor. So in the field of all rice, you know, fields, the farmer would select the, uh, or the, earlier yeah the best crop and then you know propagate mm -hmm. that and then propagate that so you keep propagating it but in the wild it's nature that's doing it by accident amazing so it so it may not even be that uh, it's actually mimicking the rose but it's developing colors which would uh, protect it yeah. and it so yeah. happens that the other one had yeah. those colors and so it's yeah. not actually mimicking the rose but it's developing similar colors because of the uh, what to say the role they play. Yeah, yeah. That's why you you know when you see mimicry patterns, you only see a subset of colors. You don't see you know uh, you you don't see new mimicry colors coming. It's either always bright red, bright orange, like you what you see in plain tigers or you know other bright colors which we know are uh, uh, you know which we know signal their uh, toxicity to predators. Yeah, it's really amazing how the intelligence of nature works. It's uh, mind-boggling sometimes, yes. Uh, I think uh, we're done with the question. Just a minute. Uh, uh, there is one, uh, not exactly a question, but there is a, a, a post from Kichur Saji. Say not related to the session, sir, but could you ex share your experience on the rediscovery of the lilac silver line in India? I mean, that was a very accidental finding. I was part of uh, this group which was doing a survey on understanding how photographers were harming the Esselgata habitat. And when I was walking and taking measurements of all the uh, tire tracks that the people had uh, made by driving around and destroying the habitat. I saw this one butterfly which just jumped out and then sat down on a, on the ground and it looked very different. I first thought it was a common shot silver line and some of the so-called experts on Facebook such as, you know, Peter and Isaac said, oh, it's an aberration of common shot silver line. But it was Krishna Mingo's like, it's no way a common shot silver line. You've seen something that's, you know, not seen in 100 years. So that was the story. Thank you. So I think we're done with the questions. Uh, does anybody else want to ask any questions right now? Or we will wind up with the session. Okay. Uh, just a minute. He's saying there's some more questions. Just a minute. I'll just get water just a second. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, Rohit, could you please read out the question? Okay, so the, are you guys able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, Rohit. Okay, so um, the question is, will controlled burning be beneficial for farms or butterfly gardens? Or is it just about forests? So when you talk about farms, are you talking about, you know, farms such as paddy field and so on and so forth? Or if it's that, it's not helpful because most of the farming that's done in India already have added fertilizers, added other things. And when you have a monoculture of just one type of a, you know, uh, crop that you're growing, that really does not increase uh, the soil nutrient profile that much. Whereas in natural forests, which has a huge diversity of plants and uh, you know trees, that is where the effect will be seen a lot. But if you you know even if you you know do it in a place like JPRF, which is semi-natural because it supports a high diversity of you know plants, it might help there. But in you know agricultural farms, I don't think it will help at all because they're already saturated with so much of uh, fertilizers or even you know uh, whatever other pesticides and other things that they use that it might not really benefit and it might in fact I mean sometimes you know if it's a new let's say you know if you're doing it in uh, let's say you're burning a place in Himachal Pradesh which was never we are burning a forest land and then converting it to an agricultural field that will definitely work but if it's a already established agricultural field I don't think it will work uh, that much okay so, so the um, controlled burns that are being done currently are mostly pre preemptive measures to prevent uh, forest fires during the dry seasons. Yeah. Is there really an acceptance to implement this method for enriching the soil uh, or uh, improving butterfly populations like we spoke about? So that is something, I, you know, I, I think people have really not implemented uh, this method to say, fine, you know, if we burn, it's not only controlling the uh, amount of fire you know that we are spreading uh but it can also help the environment i don't think that thought is still instilled in a lot of you know the agencies that do control burns but hopefully you know more you know uh at least in the near future i hope that people take into account that when they're doing controlled burns it not only prevents large-scale forest fires but it can also help the ecosystem of uh e ecosystem you know in terms of plant diversity, insect diversity, not just butterflies, all the other insects as well. And I think, you know, what if, I mean, if we start doing that in JPRF and then uh, we have data to look at, okay, fine, burn and we burnt uh, the forest in uh, April 2024 and we see more butterflies in uh, the next monsoon season or right after the monsoon season, that can be a good, uh, you know, proof of concept to say, yes, burning does help butterflies even in our own uh, ecosystem because no one has really done that uh, kind of studies in India. But they have looked at how much uh, you know carbon and nitrogen increases when you burn. A lot of you know grassland ecologists have done it, but not a lot of insect people or insect scientists have done this to look at how burning can actually impact uh, insect populations. So I think you know JPRF could be the first uh, could spearhead that thing uh, next year and see how would how we go from there. Maybe we can pick one particular patch in JPRF. Yeah, that yeah like that, you know, that area where, uh, I mean, the area that I always think of when I think about JPRF is that meditation. Uh, right, the, the Golgar, the gazebo. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think uh, that would be a nice place because there's a lot of diversity there. Right. And doing that burn early during the summer season would be beneficial. Okay. I have a question with respect to this. So now we are talking about doing the burning and studying the butterfly population, but there may be other creatures also there which we have not like studied. So how do we know that it might not affect them and they they will so, not affect the ecosystem of the butterflies to come? So the thing is, most of the tropical habitats have evolved to coexist with fire, and this is like from millions of years of evolution. So before you know humans populated the world the way we have populated now there were periodic fires all the time so the thing was we never let uh, uh you know for example all of the plants that we called annuals that 
after one season they just die those periodically got burned during the dry season because of lightning or anything like that so forest fires are a very natural phenomenon so they have already co-evolved so i mean oh, so the way it improves is that one year you know it might impi- it might help one particular group of uh, uh, you know organisms and another year it might help another group of organisms and so on and so forth so it's basically a, a metric to improve the overall health of the ecosystem so uh, so even if we've not like aware of you know the numbers of the other species it is still going to come back yeah. to most probably to the same yeah uh, yeah what to say level yeah. of all yeah. like for example you, you might be thinking of you know praying mantids which uh, hmm. which are in the habitat with people rarely even you know pay attention to unless you are photographing it i mean even if you for example you know burn the area and if you say that you are going to destroy the utica i'm pretty sure that uh bring mantids from other areas would or surrounding areas come in and then in the next year they'll have more plant and more uh you know resources for them to be able to just do well so there will still be predators which can uh, feed yeah. and control the population of the butterflies also yeah yeah thanks i think i'd missed one question but you'd answered it well there's a question from tanvi satarshi saying how does mimicking butterflies get such colors which i think you kind of answered uh, from what we talked about yes i think we are done with the questions uh yes priya i think we are done with the questions yes yes so thank you nitin we, it was a really uh, you know enriching and uh, knowledge uh, giving talks the many things i'm sure each of us uh, even if many of us have known certain things there definitely lot something that we have learned which we didn't know earlier and uh, the way you put it with your you know simplified form of understanding it is something amazing i've always admired and i'm sure there are many others who feel the same so thank you so much for being here and for giving us this wonderful talk and Happy all those day. lovely stories thank you, thank you. and audience you. Uh, before we sign off uh, the recordings of all these sessions will be available on the bangalore butterfly club of the youtube channel so if you want to read go through nitin's talk or any of the other talks like i would want to please do visit the bangalore butterfly channel on youtube and uh, revisit and see them in case you've missed any of them also you can still have them available to see them thank you thank you all for joining us and being here as part of the seventh butterfly and bee awareness week thank you